Hello everyone and welcome to the Q&A. It's been a while since I've done these and I've decided to take another stab at it, up the production quality and hopefully go a little bit more in depth and at length with the answers that I give. Now to help out with that I've actually started an Ask FM page. I've seen that Ghostcrawler does it, Noble does it, a bunch of other people do it and Ask FM is just a really good platform for Q&A related things. So if you have a question then you can check out that link down in the description or as always just leave a comment down in the comments of this video. Today's first question comes from two people, Grant Pate, who said, what is your favourite old reputation to complete, and Skater098, who said, hey, what's the best rep in WoW's history and why? Both pretty similar things. And in general, I like reputations that have got a really, really strong flavour to them. The ones that I think really feel like they're a part of the world. And that's not because I get a great deal out of roleplaying, I don't, it's because I think they are the reps which Blizzard is generally able to pull off the best. I think when there's a really strong fantasy then, you kind of find that the art, the music and the gameplay all just follow on from that and make something that's really cool. So with that in mind, my favourites would actually be the Argent Tournament and Netherwing. Netherwing was the first major rep that I actually did and it's something that very quickly followed up the hype of unlocking Epic Flying. Now, I really like how this reputation was optional, but still had really, really good gameplay to it, or at least for the day. Plus, it also had a really cool reward, which was mostly unique to the rep. Now, when we look at Warlords of Draenor, you've got optional reputations that have got really poor gameplay, and they offer recolors of stuff that's already available, so it's not really that exciting. If there was maybe a brand new sort of mount type, that one of those wild reputations gave and maybe if it had some uh, some proper like content to it then I think it would be exciting. Anyway, first of all, as you wrapped up with Netherwing, you kind of went along this small story that progressed and I thought that progression was pretty fun, especially because it unlocked more and more quests as you went through it. And some of those quests were really cool, especially the racing quests. I still remember getting really frustrated trying to, I think it was finish the fourth one, but uh, there was quite a feeling of accomplishment after you did those racing quests, which I thought was just a really, really cool thing. Now, actually, just as a side note about those, like, fun quests, I really like stuff like that. You had the racing quests and the Cloud Serpent people. You had the racing quests um, that, uh, that went on with Netherwing. There was that really cool, like, barrel rolling quest in the Gate of the Setting Sun. In general, I think Blizzard can actually make some really fun little quests um, here and there to split things up. I think sometimes it's possible to go way too far in terms of like just putting in like ridiculous gimmick quests like the stupid, you know, Mushan whacking um, stuff that went on in Mists of Pandaria. But I think it is good to have the odd quest there. And I think those quests work the best when they don't really give you anything extra to learn. I.e. they're kind of a twist on the controls and gameplay that you already know, so there's no real learning involved. If one of those quests presents you with a really, really big action bar or like some convoluted things with long tooltips, then I don't think it's a lot of fun. But if it's something as simple as point the cannon here, shoot the thing, do a quick bombing run or maybe a race, then I think those quests can actually be a just a really a great deal of fun that breaks stuff up a little bit. That said, I do like Warlords of Draenor's um, sort of quest flow and in general, I am okay with the regular MMO questing affair, just as long as it's well paced and involves some really cool stuff throughout the world. And of course, if it's broken up by some of that really nice exploration content. Anyway, back to Netherwing. Oddly enough, it was one of the few times that we saw Illidan during the questing of the expansion, and it was a really cool encounter as well. It's strange how they did that stuff just in general so well with his reputation, and now in Warlords, they haven't been able to come close to it. I kind of wish that the um, Dracorium was a reputation um, where you could get maybe Fey Dragons, and the same goes for the Rylax stuff. Anyway, moving on to the Argent Tournament. Well, First, I think we just need to talk about the aesthetic of this place. Its music is still some of my favourite in the game, and I love how it really juxtaposes the music of the surrounding areas. You know, that stuff's all like sort of a bit dark, a bit sort of depressing and threatening. And then you hit the Argent Crusade and its com or tournament, and it's completely different. I thought that was really nice. And of course, the actual art assets are really stellar as well. And this is one of those hubs where it kind of really felt like home which is something that they rarely managed to pull off. Certainly, it was far more memorable than Lion's Landing, the Saberstalker Hovel, or, um, you know, the Town Hall that contains all the other Warlords of Draenor reps. 
Now the gameplay of this place was also a little bit different. I didn't mind the joust thing at all, because once you actually work out the strategy, it's really quite simple to get right. Though I do get why people thought it was a bit of a pain in the ass, and yeah, that stuff's fair enough. And we also had a group quest here with this rep, and I think that was definitely welcome. And overall, there was a solid progression, because as you ranked up, you unlocked more rewards, and there was more quest content to do. And the initial process of gaining your rank, and, you know, being a sort of a different kind of crusader, and all of that stuff, was actually kind of, kind of rewarding, and it definitely fulfilled that fantasy. The issue, of course, that you get is, well, the amount of um, repetition that ended up happening, especially for those of us who are interested in collecting mounts. That's not something that really bothered me that much, but I totally get why it's a really big annoyance. If they were doing this again, I think I'd rather they just did less mounts, but have more mounts that are actually unique. Or I'd hope so, because the store seems to just suck up all of the really good, unique-looking mounts these days. Oh, and also, this had the Black Knight questline. I thought that was really fun, and I especially like how it tied the story of that questline into the dungeon. Overall, some really good stuff, and a bit of great world content that I think, despite its problems, did give quite a lot of fun, optional gameplay. Next, I've got a question from Stormfo Show, who asks, who or what got you into World of Warcraft, and could you share your first experience? Well, what got me into World of Warcraft was seeing people play it, mainly at my local LAN center. Back in the day, I was a member of the local rowing club, and despite all of that, like, fitness stuff going on, a bunch of us would then, after training, piss off to the local LAN center and play games for hours and eat pot noodles and crisps and things that are not that healthy. Um, now, most of us, or most of what I was doing as well, was Call of Duty 2, mainly Call of Duty 2, a little bit of Call of Duty 4, tiny bit of Counter-Strike, a good bit of Battlefield 2, not the shite console version, and uh, then good old classics like Command and & Conquer. And by the way, as much as the MMO crowd may like shit in Call of Duty, yeah, Call of Duty 2, fucking awesome game, so bloody good, amazing combat, a lot of fun, high skill ceiling as well, um, and definitely something that I think needs to be played on the PC, on multiplayer, like I've still got great memories of running around with my car 98k, on um, St. Mary Gleese, on uh, Tujan, on Carantan. Fantastic maps, fantastic memories. But uh, let's get back to World of Warcraft. So while I was there, a um, bunch of the regulars also played World of Warcraft, and I specifically remember watching somebody run around on, uh, on a ram in the Badlands. So with that fresh in my memory, I ended up watching the South Park episode, uh, Make Love Not Warcraft, and I ended up signing up to the game on New Year's Eve of 2007. And bar a few breaks, I've pretty much been playing ever since. I started a human warrior, as I think a lot of people ended up doing. I know, boring as shit, but whatever. Um, but shortly after that, I swapped over to a dwarf hunter, which was my main for quite a good amount of time. Soon, a bunch of friends move, uh, moved over to a new server, though, during um, sort of the like later on TBC stuff. I think when I was max level, not 100% sure on that. But I ended up um, transferring the warrior to a new server, and then shortly after Wrath of the Lich King... Um, started. I really did play a lot of my warrior, sort of running it up through dungeons and things like that. I took a little bit of a break, and then I started off my Draenei Hunter, which has been my main ever since. And shortly after hitting max level on that character, I found my current guild, I got into their Trial of the Crusader raids, and uh, that eventually ended up with me being on the progression team for Ice Crown Citadel. It's kind of funny how I started off knowing, like basically not knowing how to tank at the very start of the expansion, and then I ended up being a half-decent progression raider on my hunter. I probably owe a lot of that success to Kraparian's videos, because I do remember being able to put out pretty high numbers, though we did have this other hunter who was, like, crazy hunter Jesus, who, like, I don't know where his numbers came from back then, they were kind of crazy. But essentially, that is, um, my sort of start off into World of Warcraft, covering the first, like, two years, and you can pretty much guess the rest, really. Next, I've got a question from Ali Farstrider, who said, Of all of the expansions, which one do you think has the strongest or best-looking equipment, as far as sets or individual drops? He also said, The transmog competition sounds fantastic, and it'll be a blast. I hope so, I'm still working the transmog thing. Um, it should be different to all the people who are like, Oh, Lazy Peon does a transmog competition. Mine will be different to his. That That's definitely a thing that'll happen, don't worry. And in case people want to stir shit, no, we're all friends and we all talk to each other in the kind of YouTube group. So yeah, everything's different and it should be fun. But anyway, onto the question. I think Wrath of the Lich King has the best armor overall, probably because for me, Ulduar's sets are just so very good. 
Um, this stuff is all very subjective though, and the more northern theme of Wrath of the Lich King appeals to me personally a lot more than pretty much any other theme that could be. I also really like some of the sets from the Burning Crusade though, and it seems as if they were a lot more ballsy back then in terms of creating gear. So while that resulted in some just really, really dumb looking and bits of gear, it also resulted in some really iconic sets as well. Though sadly, much of it's really too low of a resolution to transmog well with more recent sets. So overall, to answer your question, I think it's Wrath of the Lich King, though I can see a lot of people saying it's uh, TBC or maybe even Cataclysm. Next, I've got a question from Andrew Ducasse, who says, I read from uh, time to time people complaining about Warcraft's game engine as it's very old. Could you go into detail about how exactly the game engine works and the downsides of Warcraft's and even the posi uh, positives too, if possible? Okay, so first of all, I can't answer this question completely um, because my experience in terms of game engines is really quite specific. Though, renderers, that's a thing I can sort of talk about. So first, to give you some background on my software engineering experience, and by the way, that's the subject, which pretty much pertains to all of this engineering, uh, engine stuff even. Uh, basically, I've got the equivalent of a um, bachelor's degree, and now I don't actually have that bachelor's degree um, because... Basically, I have to wait until I finish my master's year before I actually get a qualification, um, though I could cash out with that bachelor's now if I were to forego that extra year. And now all of that said, I did play second in my year in the game engine development module. Now, first, a game engine comprises of many, many different things. You've got your networking, you've got your physics, you've got your render, and a myriad of other different systems. Um, now, what I've got experience with creating is the renderer and lucky enough, they actually changed a lot of their rendering tech in and around Warlords of Draenor, so that's actually something that we can talk about. Now, what I made was a forward renderer, which um, the overall system is essentially a procedurally generated solar system, which contains a whole bunch of different planet types, and then each planet's terrain is being um, generated using a fractal algorithm, and then it's textured procedurally using a technique called procedural splat mapping. Splat mapping is a fun phrase to say. Now, oddly enough, um, the planets ended up, because I didn't, I basically didn't take a lot of time making this look pretty, I was just like, ah, code features, code features, instead of beautification, but the planets sort of end up with this odd Age of Empires feel to them, which isn't really intended, but thankfully we were being marked on the quality of our code and not the prettiness of our images. Um, now, there are some other bells and whistles, like the tessellation pipeline for LOD, um, geometry shader fun with asteroids, but that's basically the long and short of it. So the rendering component is what produces the image that you actually see on the screen. Now, World of Warcraft, from what I can tell, moved from using a forward renderer to a deferred renderer, and then to a hybrid of the two with patch 6.1. Now, forward rendering, to give you a super quick explanation, is basically you make all your geometry, do all your lighting, you kind of do that all at once and then you draw it. Now, there's a lot more to that, but I think explaining the OpenGL pipeline isn't really worth getting into in this video. Now, deferred rendering is a bit different. You sort of build up a texture in steps, and then you draw that to the screen. So for an example, you could build up your geometry, and then do a lighting pass, then do another lighting pass, another lighting pass. You can, you know, make your shadow map, do some bloom effects, things like that. And essentially, you build up what your final image is going to be in, um, in stages. And then after you've done all your stages, you just draw that out to the screen. Now, both of them have got their pros and their cons. But for an example, the reason why we lost true anti-aliasing in patch uh, 6.0 is because a deferred render doesn't really support it. Now, because you build up your final image in loads and loads of different stages with a deferred renderer, you end up having to use a kind of edge detecting algorithm, kind of like the edge filter, I suppose, in Photoshop or something like that, to work out where all of the jaggy edges are, and then you kind of blur them a bit to make them look less jaggy. Now, there are more modern techniques, which are basically the kinds of AA that they had in patch 6.0, but if we're honest, they're kind of crap, and in 6.0, we could still see loads of jaggies in the game, which wasn't particularly cool. Now, on patch 6.1, we got a whole bunch of new effects, including proper anti-aliasing. Now, my knowledge on this is actually really limited in terms of what a hybrid of uh, forward and deferred is, but basically, it seems like they're using a bit of a hybrid, um, which kind of gets the best of both worlds. It's something I'm going to have to learn anyway, because I'll be implementing it for my master's project, but basically, that's the... what seems to me, anyway, to be the evolution of the kind of graphical front of World of Warcraft. 
So overall, when we look at what they can do with patch 6.1 and above, they've got a very, very capable system on their hands. I mean, look at the game now. It's got those absolutely beautiful new lightning effects, which I think just look fantastic. So they have made a lot of really great steps very recently in terms of what the game actually looks like. Now that said, I've got to imagine that under the hood, there are still a lot of issues which go back to how old the engine is at its very core. But I think one big issue that World of Warcraft's engine has is its use of resources. It doesn't make good use of additional stuff. If you've got graphics cards and SLI, well, tough luck, you're not really going to see much benefit from that. And if, um, if you're talking about CPU, well, their CPU usage characteristics are really, really poor. It just does not utilize multiple cores and um, threads really that well at all. So here I am sitting with my, uh, my hyper-threaded i7 processor and, uh, <laughs> yeah, not, not really of, of much use. Now, this is one of the reasons why World of Warcraft actually performs really quite poorly on AMD processors, because at a similar price point to Intel, the AMD processor will generally have a higher amount of weaker cores. Now, that means that because each core is weaker and World of Warcraft doesn't use multiple cores very well, the game ain't gonna run that well, which is a bit unfortunate. Now, to give you a quick example of some of the graphical stuff, I can get uh, comparable frame rates on World of Warcraft to the likes of Witcher 3, Grand Theft Auto 5, and Battlefield 4 on nearly maxed out settings on a 3440 by 1440 monitor. Now, that's kind of crazy when you think about how those games actually look in comparison to each other. And really, I think a lot of this just comes down to the age of the engine, and honestly, I've got no idea what the technical blockers down there actually are. Overall, though, they can do a lot graphically now that they've done those upgrades, so hopefully there's going to be good room for improvement there, hopefully with the next expansion, because that's generally when they seem to try to do big leaps and bounds in terms of their effects. As far as other stuff goes, well, clearly their networking is absolutely rock solid, and it would seem that their biggest issue would be making use of available hardware, so hopefully they do have a way to get around that problem because it is a right pain in the arse. So there's really what I can say on an engine front, saying anything more would really be overstepping my bound, and I'm pretty sure any like actual hardcore software engineers who are in the industry um, are going to cringe at various things that I say because they're probably, like I'm probably sort of right, but uh, not really that right, so whatever, that's just my really, my two cents on it. Now, another part of Andrew's question was uh, the positives of the World of Warcraft engine. Well, one positive of this stuff all being kind of, I suppose, old is internally they've probably got really, really, really good tools. As in, they've been working with this, this engine for so long that they've likely got a very robust quest creation system, a very robust world creation system. You know, they're probably very good at texturing things. Their animation pipeline's probably really good. Basically, because it's so old, like, the staff will be very good at using all of that stuff, and their internal tool sets um, will probably be quite advanced. Or, um, at least it will have seen a lot of development to make it really efficient to use. Now, as much as I do believe all that stuff is true about the efficiency of their tools and all of that stuff, I still don't really know why we get so little content in patches these days. Um, just in general, I mean, the content per month of World of Warcraft from, like, right now in comparison to, say, the first half of Mr. Pandaria, really not that great, despite the fact that it is a bigger team. So, I don't really know what's going on there. Probably some sort of production issue, but really, that's probably all that I can say about engine stuff. I'm still, like, pretty much a newbie at this, so that's, like, my two cents based on what I know. Obviously, people who are, like, do this for a living. I mean, right now, I'm using Unity to develop things, so I'm not really getting down and dirty with the sort of nitty-gritty actual workings of things. And the project that I did do was completely from the ground up in uh, C++ and OpenGL, so how that fits into like a wider game engine system, honestly, I don't really know that well. I, I can talk a bit about renders, but overall, um, yeah, take what I say with a grain of salt. As always, I mean, always take what anyone says with a grain of salt and think about it yourself, but yeah, that's it for the renderer stuff, and that is it for this first episode of the kind of revamped q and I'm still not 100% sure about how long I'll try to make them, Overall, I do want them to be a bit more higher quality, though, than the past stuff, so let me know down in the comments. Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.